Good afternoon. I'm Dara Bunjan. I am the food enthusiast here at J. Moore Living. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm a food writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. Please feel free during the interview with our guests to submit your questions or comments. I will be looking over here a little bit to check the computer for them. And also, I like to remind people that we have a whole cache of interviews on jmoreliving.com and Facebook that you can take on your walks, runs, and your drives. Today's guest is Zena Polin, who was the founder of the uh, Ramy award-winning restaurant, The Daily Dish. And that was in Silver, that is in Silver Spring. She's one of the founders of that. And the Ramy Award is the Metro DC Restaurant Awards for the best in the area. She is currently affiliated with Hummingbird Restaurant in Old Town Alexandria. Zena is the most interesting woman in the world. How do I know that? <laughs> she never says anything tastes like chicken, even chicken. And Cuba imports cigars to her. <laughs> she does like a good cigar. Welcome, Zena. How's, welcome to the show. And what's on your plate for today? Hey there. How are you? Well, today I'm sitting over here in, uh, in Hummingbird. You can see we're in our lunch service. I just had a good friend. I blew him a kiss. I just had a good friend come and say hi. Uh, okay. You'll see people wandering around behind me because I like to do this right in the middle of things and so you can see how it, see the activity. So we're just in lunch service. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful, maybe a little rainy day, but we've got a gorgeous view. I think you can see we have these beautiful windows here. Um, You're right on the water yeah, in Old Town. Right, we're right, right on the water. We're, we're towards the end of you come down King Street and Bear Right, where towards the end, where they just put in the new developments down there. It's just absolutely gorgeous to look at. You'll see me switching. I'm just trying to get this to come up on the computer. Um, I'm going to go back a bit. And, you know, we've been friends, acquaintances for a while. And there were a lot of things I didn't know about you. So uh, the investigator and me dug up a couple of things, but let's inform people. I say you're the most interesting woman in the world. There's so many levels to you. You have a degree in interna international affairs, your master's in international management from Arizona, Arizona State U. You're a native New Yorker. How did you end up with a PR firm in Puerto Rico and writing for travel magazines? Well, I, uh, what happened was um, sometime many moons ago, I moved myself down to Puerto Rico, actually, and started working down there for about eight, 10 years. And that's where I really, well, that's where my Spanish evolved. Um, it was a wonderful place to be. And I worked to kind of work with Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. and coordinate the two for our right. Department of Economic Development down there. And I started getting into the kind of PR, marketing, and communications, and I brought myself back to D.C. Um, just right about the time everything was collapsing, um, in about 2008 or 9, and uh, came back here and started up my business here. At the time, I was also managing editor of St. Kitts and Nevis, their visitor magazine and their Discover magazine. Um, and then I came back here and I partnered in and we founded the Daily Dish and seven years later, the Dish and Dram. So at that point, I really just devoted everything to the restaurant business because it was starting to become my whole life. Well, why food? I mean, you, you had another avenue you were in, the travel, uh, rel public relations. When did you, what flipped you over? When was that aha moment? Well, I had been catering um, back in the design cuisine right out of college. I started catering with them, and it was something that I had always done to make money. It was a great money maker back then in college, and I stayed with it. Um, as I was traveling back and forth, when I was living in Australia, I came back, and I went back into the catering business, and then I moved to Puerto Rico. And when I came back here, as I said, the economy was crashing. It was 2008 and nine, and... Um, I didn't really know what to do. It wasn't the best time for even the restaurant business, but I partnered 
uh, up and um, it was a nice time, ironically, to open a restaurant because we didn't know what we were doing wrong or right. We just were surviving. And that, my, put it this way, when I said I owned a restaurant, my mother said, this is what you are always meant to do. And I said, really? And she said, yes, absolutely. You were always meant to do that. So apparently, and, and I had always written about, the thing is I was a food and travel writer and I had always incorporated two even before I owned the restaurant. So it was just something kind of a passion of mine. I always thought I would go to the CIA and then I didn't like the hours, which is ironic given now I work all the hours. But so it was kind right. of always in this background and at some point it just became a life's choice. Um, you mentioned your mother. Um, did I read something that she had a cafe or she has a cafe right now? She bakes, did she? Oh, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, actually, no. I mean, she and my father owned a bar back when I was growing up. They actually owned a bar called The Witch's Brew, which was um, mentioned in the Amityville Horror book, not the movie, but the book itself. And now she has what's called a poetry cafe, which is actually a cafe. She kind of took her love of all of that and she put it into a, it's her Facebook page called The Poetry Cafe, which she absolutely loves. So I'm really the baker, but she was more of, uh, my parents were both French and Spanish uh, language teachers. And so she means it more of a cafe in that sense of, you know, where you would all gather around and, and you know, read poetry to uh, each other, talk, that kind of a thing. So, Well, I saw that she did a book of poetry. So that writing comes she naturally. A couple of them. Right. And um, did I read somewhere, I mean, you're multilingual, that you're, what did your father do? It was something about, was it flashcards? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I speak um, French and Spanish and English. I think in this industry, Spanish has really become the most important thing and lived in a lot of Central American countries and in Puerto Rico. Um, so my dad was renowned for doing uh, flashcards as he drove, and that's how he was constantly keeping his mind sharp. So as a kid, I really spoke French before I spoke English because my parents started me on that. And from that, I, I was fortunate enough to, I can read a lot of languages. I can know a lot of alphabets. I can't always speak it very well, but it's been something that's important. And I think in today's world, being multilingual, especially in my industry or in our industry, the restaurant industry is, is super right. important. And, um, you know, especially with kitchens that have a lot of Central Americans where I, I spent a significant amount of time in Salvador and Guatemala. Um, so I have a connection to people that way, a cultural connection. And, and, and it's, I'm very fortunate in that sense that my parents thought that that was very important in life. It's, it's so much easier to learn a language when you're young. You, there's no barriers. I couldn't learn a language like exactly. Amanda Cushman is going to be on the show next week. And she's retired to Spain. She says, I'm learning Spanish. For me to learn a language now, I oh, can't remember wow. why I walked through into the kitchen, let alone a new language. So very lucky <laughs> and very talented. Um, you just did something with the Anthony Bourdain movie um, through Hummingbird. Why don't you fill us in on that? Well, so I was asked by a friend of mine, Jamie Shore, if I would participate in the AFI Docs um, premiere. Um, the AFI docs were the movies that they had last week, all the documentaries. And she asked if I would help with the premiere. And the way that they did it is they had a mixologist and a chef um, cooking up a dish that was inspired by Anthony Bourdain and allowed us to tell a little bit of stories of kind of what he meant to, to, to us. And I think if you're in the food industry, he means something to everybody for a variety of different reasons. And um, I had been particularly inspired by one of his chapters um, from Lerner Den, the fish butcher, Husto Thomas, and Hummingbird Bar and Kitchen. We were right on the water, as you said, in Old Town, and fish is a really important part of our life. So I used that to create this two dishes with the Pacifico sea bass, this crudo that had a popcorn crema and popcorn dust, and a grilled whole fish that we also do. And during that time, I got to tell a few stories of how I felt in my way connected to Anthony Bourdain and what his stories meant and the kind of lesson that I had learned from, from him. You know, with all your travels, I know that you've traveled all over the world and um, I'm just trying to think, what is it? Um, I have my notes here. Uh, you went to Reykjavik. 
that was a that was a recent trip and that was a, kind of a life altering list i've been to about 70 plus countries and if i were to put a country in the top three it was probably iceland uh, we started in Reykjavik. I was celebrating my friend Jerry's birthday, and there was a group of us there. Um, and as I tell the story, we were sitting in a hot tub, and the aurora borealis was just splendid above us. It was amazing. Right. And a friend of hers is an astronaut slash pilot, and she's telling about how, how they navigate by the North Star, and Jerry's singing opera. And it was really, truly a bucket list moment. And then I came back and decided I needed a tattoo. Uh, my very first, even though within this industry, most people are tattooed all over, but I got my very first tattoo, uh, which is a little bit of a trauma for everybody. And, uh, but I love it. And it's a, a veg vizier, which is a Icelandic magical stave, which guides the travelers even when they don't know where they're going. And so, True. yeah, it was a, an homage to travel, food and adventure. I have to ask you, while you were there, did you eat any of the fermented shark? I ate the fermented shark, and um, I had two little tiny bites of it, and it tasted pretty much what you would imagine, like fermented and almost like that uric acid. Um, it was not enjoyable. It wasn't probably the very worst thing I've ever eaten. I can't tell you what topped it. <laughs> um, but I did have that. I stayed away from some of the other more exotic things that, like, you know, they, they have puffins, but puffins on the endangered list, so you don't really want to drink, eat that. But yeah, I did try the fermented shark. I would not try it again. I think once is I, enough. What? Well, at least you tried it, you know. Indeed. Didn't our parents say to us, at least take a bite? Yes. So yes. you did good. I was going to say, um, with all your travels, that maybe you're the female version, Anthony Bourdain, but you were hesitant on some. I'm not <laughs> sure you would eat everything that he had tried, but you were definitely adventurous. Yeah. What is the I best? Tried. Yeah. We, just to let people know, we have a slight delay here between um, Zena hearing me. So if you see me pause for a bit. What was the best or worst piece of advice? that you received or both? Well, I like to say, um, and you probably were there when we were at uh, WCR, Women's Chefs and Restaurant Tours annual conference. Um, I remember uh, Ruth Resser, who owns Pizzeria Paradiso here in DC. She was talking about how women don't necessarily set themselves up for business in the proper way and that we needed to, to do that more. And this was one of the comments we've always discussed in, our, in WCR. And so the, the, the best advice that I got and the advice that I tell every woman in particular who I meet is to hire an attorney. And hire an attorney from step one, hire an attorney when you're thinking about a concept, hire an attorney when you're buying a concept, hire an attorney, hire a good attorney and pay for them because you need to think as an entrepreneur and as a businesswoman, and there are more women than I'd like to count who think that a handshake deal is a handshake deal, but it's just not. So number one advice, hire an attorney, and if you wanna go into business, if you wanna be a restaurant owner, if you wanna do something within business, protect yourself and, and your assets. Um. Let's talk about your partnering over with uh, Michelle Armstrong and your Fempire. You want to explain <laughs> that to people? Sure. So I work with uh, Michelle Armstrong. And as I said, we're here in Hummingbird Bar and Kitchen. And she's over there in the back doing what she does, keeping the place looking marvelous and spectacular because she has the sense of design and uh, keeps the standards here high and, um, and matches, um, matches a beautiful, beautiful restaurant. And together we're um, hoping to open our next concept, which would be kind of a market, uh, uh, market retail space. We're, we're working on doing that in the near future. And we like to say, actually, it was Michelle's word, and I love it, building a fempire, uh, you know, an empire run by women. And so here 
we have the two of us and we have a woman, Jeff, and um, we think she's really just the best we can hire. So we try to, we try to focus on that. And I think it's fun. Um, and I think it's a great time to be doing that. Is that the concept called Beauty Society Fair? Yep, it's Beauty by Society Fair. Michelle was the founder of Society Fair here in uh, Alexandria, and that closed a couple years ago as they focused on, um, so this is part of a kind of a group of restaurants. There's Hummingbird Bar, Bar and Kitchen. We have our sister restaurant, Kaliwa on the Wharf, um, which really has a lot to do with Michelle's uh, Philippine culture. It's Asian food. And then we have uh, Maddie and Eddie's, which is a new restaurant that opened in Pentagon, and that's... Um, that is more the Irish side of it, really just a wonderful place. So uh, we, have all, we have all three and uh, Society Fair was one of their, one of their uh, restaurants when they also have a restaurant eat here in Old Town. But uh, now we just, we have these three as part of the group. I, I wanna tell people just to let you know that all the links will be coming up in the notes and will be up on Facebook, but let me just go over them before I forget. Hummingbirds, Website is hummingbirdva.net. And all that um, Zena does, her travels, everything she gets her little hands into is the dailydishdc.com. And you can find out everything that she's doing in the travel and food. And Facebook, there are sites of the Daily Dish DC and Hummingbird OTX. Instagram is Hummingbird OTX and Daily Dish DC. But they will float up in the notes and you can get those. Um, let's talk about the photograph that you just did for the Lee Project. <laughs> Oh, yes. My that editor made a comment course. on it. And he said, why didn't you send that picture in? <laughs> well, that was wonderful. First of all, it, you know, the it, Lee Initiative. So the reason that we did it, it was brought to us by a good friend of mine. Uh, Wendy Gordon came and said, do you want to do something that's going to help the restaurant industry? And this was, she came to me at the end of last year in 2019 in December. And and I said, of course, you know, we, we raise funds to help displace restaurants workers, you know, we'd, we'd be delighted to do that. And um, she was working with Peter Breslow over in Philadelphia, was working with Revivalist Gin. And the, the concept was that they had done this prior in Philly, which was, uh, we say, naked chefs, right? It became naked chefs, mixologists, restaurant owners. And then uh, we took the picture, Michelle and I took our picture on the bar at the restaurant. We brought in some friends of ours, uh, Jojo, who owned um, the game in Adams Morgan, our friend Daniel, um, and, and a couple of other friends. And we had this wonderful, wonderful um, grouping of people. So it was, you know, Daniel Duke's Groceries, the game, us, a, a couple of mixologists. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. And then they put those pictures together and released them over five weeks, I think it was, and raised more than $5,000 to go to the Lee Initiative. And we all really enjoyed being part of that. Well, you know, you, you can't be a, a restaurateur without being committed to the community. It's just part of the gene factor of being a restaurateur. And you're known for your um, sharing, not only for charities, but being a mentor for people within the business. You always have an ear to listen and um, let me thank you for that right now before I forget and thank all restaurateurs because it's our time now to come back and support them. They need us to help them at this point. Um, what jobs in a restaurant haven't you done? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is years ago when I was a wee student over at GWU, George Washington University, I had my first waitressing shift at a restaurant that no longer exists. And uh, it's actually where my friend Daniel's Duke's Grocery is now. And it went through several re reincarnations. It was before it was Kincaid's. And I was the worst server in the history of servers. I mean, I think I lasted a month if I lasted that long. It could have been a week. And I was awful at it. And then I managed to go into catering, which was something that I enjoyed. Um, and then from that, as I said, you know, I, I, 
I, I have my restaurants. I really expanded on doing pastry. And I like to say I can do, I can be in my kitchen. I can't cook protein. I can't cook. I don't, I mean, I can't cook chicken or meat. I stay away from the grill. I stay away from saute. If I'm in my kitchen, I'm going to be doing something like salads, pastry. Here we do cheese and charcuterie. But the behind the the, the, the behind the line cooking proteins, I save for the pros. That's not where my strength is. Okay, but you do the thing. You love baking, and to me, that's torture. I don't yep. know how many fails I've had. <laughs> but um, is there a a recipe uh, a a dish, a baking dish that is your best? So I think I do two really great dishes that are so simple. And I just put these on my website, actually. Um, I do flourless chocolate cake and I do a key lime pie. And the funny thing with the key lime pie is everybody who likes key lime pie has their own recipe. And they'll all say, oh my God, mine is better, mine is better. And um, I have a very simplistic recipe that I adapted off of Cook's Illustrated that I think is the absolute easiest and best recipe. I use a freshly pressed key lime juice on it always, not lime juice, but a freshly pressed key lime juice that we bring in. I don't press the limes myself because of more timing and quantity. And then I do a beautiful, super easy flourless chocolate that also was inspired by, by Cook's Illustrated that just uses a really good chocolate um, basically eggs and butter, and I throw in some raspberry liqueur and espresso into it. We serve both of these at all my restaurants. I've always served them, and um, we serve both of them both of them here, too. They're easy, they're traditional, they're classic, and I, I think those are my two, easy, two, my two favorite. Okay. And people can find the recipe up on thedailydishdc.com. Let me ask you this. Um... Oh, I had the thought, and it's gone. Um, let's see. Uh, if you were to pick a country to go back to that you've been to, which would it be? I mean, I my dream is to, um, if it's a long-term thing, I, I always say I want to retire in Argentina. Argentina to me, I've gone there twice. I've spent a significant amount of time each time, a month or so there at each time. It's a beautiful country. It's easy to live in. I think as an American, the hardest thing is getting used to the 10 o'clock for dinner thing. You know, at six o'clock when we here in the US, they're just having their cake and pastry. Um, but to me, Argentina just has everything. It has all the different climates. Of course, it has a beautiful wine region. It has wonderfully priced meats. It has markets, um, friendly people. Um, I would live in Buenos Aires if I could. That would be my kind of, that's that's something that I'd like. And plus it's really close to Uruguay. And I happen to absolutely love Uruguayan wines. Um, I have friends there who have wineries and you could just take the boat on over. So that would kind of be where I would do a long-term trip. As a short-term one, I would probably want to go back to Sweden because we went in March and it was cold. <laughs> it was so, so very cold. And we didn't get to do enjoy the things in the spring and summer, go out to the, the small islands and, and have some of the foods and, and enjoy some of the restaurants that were closed during that season. So a short-term trip, I have Sweden and, and actually Iceland during um, – slightly warmer weather too. We had to make the choice to go to Iceland to see the midnight sun or to see the aurora borealis. And so we chose to go at the end of October and we're really fortunate to hit two days to be able to see that. Um, so I'd like to be able to see the midnight sun. That Those are the things that are really on top of my list. Right. You know, and you were talking about Argentina and beef. You're the Daily Dish had a hamburger that won many awards. Has that translated over to Hummingbird? Well, yeah. I mean, we did a we did a beautiful hamburger over there, and here at Hummingbird, we kind of played around with it, and we do what's called a smash burger. So we take these two old beef patties, we get American cheese, we do a sauce that's kind of similar to a Thousand Island sauce, a sesame seed bun, and stack it up. I like to add some bacon to it. We do a house-made fries here, which is a traditional Irish recipe that it, it, they're absolutely delicious. These are the only fries that I'll even eat cold because they're so good. 
Um, and I, I'll eat those as leftovers. And so we do this ginormous burger. If you want a picture of it, look over on Instagram. And it's just wonderful and juicy and delicious. And I, I personally think it's it's one of the best. I, I enjoy burgers at my friend's restaurants, but I think this one's one of the best. I'm getting hungry. I'm salivating thinking about it. And I want to tell people that you are very committed to taking care of yourself. You run, is it every day, every other day? You're at the, you called yourself a gym rat. I think <laughs> yes, in some I of am. the notes. So how, is it every day that you're working out? Well, I mean, I try, I think five days a week I'm doing something. I try to take one day to do nothing and let my body recoup. Sometimes now, I mean, ironically during COVID, it was a little easier. Um, I live in DC, so uh, I go to Vita Gym, which is around the corner from me. And I would often run and walk and go to the gym and use up the time that we all had. Now that life becomes a little bit back to normal, but I, I got up this morning and I was at the gym at 6.30 this morning. It's, um, I like to say, especially in our industry where there's a lot of, um, a lot of issues um, that to me, working out keeps my head clear. It helps me sleep better. It helps my diet better. And I've learned that you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people. So it keeps me fresh and it's important. And I, you know, I was up at 6.30 this morning and I thought, why am I awake? And like once I got to the gym and was there for an hour, it's really refreshing and it, it's worth it. It's sometimes a little tiring, but it really does get me started for my day. It, it's funny. You said it was a discussion we had at dinner. You have to take care of yourself before mm -hmm. you can take care of others. And that's for sure. And um, I have something here and I don't know where it came from, and if I wrote it down from reading, what is left fork? Oh, so that was the name. So uh, when we created our original business, the business is for, when we created the Dish and Dram restaurant in Kensington, Maryland, uh, we wanted to create a corporation, and I was trying to think of a name that reflected uh, reflected me and my partner, and we always seem to be taking, some people would say the wrong fork, we decided we would take the left fork. And then also with that, my mother and father had this traditional set of a fork and spoon from the 1964 New York Fair that they had bought on the wall of our kitchen that had been there since even before I was born. And so there was this attachment to that. So when we created the business name, the LLC, we created Left Fork. And then I, I left that in the, I've, I've sold those restaurants and now am I focusing now uh, with Michelle on some new partnerships. But I always thought it was a, a fun name. And I, I think it was my friend Daniel or somebody who came up with that. And was like, you're always taking the left fork. <laughs> and, and I thought that, that it's, it's a nice thing to do, right? Sometimes, sometimes you take the wrong fork and it becomes the right one. Agreed. And you never know what that path is going to lead to. There's always something else. There's another fork in that left fork that can take you down the right avenue. That's for sure. <laughs> um, that I'm just looking, looking, looking through my notes. There's a ton of things I can ask you, but I see where we're running time wise and I know you have to get back to work. So let me do my wrap up questions. What was your most epic culinary fail? Oh, I can tell you that I was, uh, it was early on in owning the restaurant. We were catering an event for maybe 80 people and I had to make mini apple pies and I used salt instead of sugar um, and found out about that a little too late. So I remade everything except for apparently four or five of them um, that managed to get out to the guests and those guests were like, why are you so salty and horrible? But at least the other I think it was maybe two that made it out to be honest with you and every other one was okay so I, I kind of got to slide away with that but that was uh that was hours of my life and uh and misery so that was the goal fail I taste now I learn to no matter what it is I'm inevitably even if it says salt there's a chance that or sugar there's a chance I'm tasting it to not have that mistake again Right. Well, somebody, in, especially in a restaurant, could have put the wrong thing in a container and you and it's marked as such. You are not the first. Oh, I, chef I'm pretty sure it was all me. <laughs> <laughs> you are not the first person in the restaurant industry to sit there and tell me that they use salt instead of sugar <laughs> in something. 
Um, and my final question is, what didn't I ask you that I should have? Well, I mean, I think gosh, you, you did the, you did the, the, the whole thing. Um, let me give me one second. I would say what you should have asked me is what's my favorite drink. And most people know, and you probably didn't ask because you know, um, I'm a, I'm a rye drinker and I love rye and, um, I love a good Austrian wine. And I think if uh, people are out there looking for some something new to drink, uh, especially during the summertime, maybe hit up a nice Gruner from Austria or make themselves a, a fun rye cocktail. I think it's a, a good good for the season. But otherwise, I think Daria, you you hit all of the high points and maybe a couple of the lows too. There with my big <laughs> fail. I thank you for jumping in and being part of this, Zena. All the best. And until the next time we go restaurant hopping or I get down to see you at Hummingbird, stay well, stay happy. Moi, and Look forward I'm to going it. to go wrap up a couple of notes here. Have a great day. Okay, everyone. Um, I just want to say that I'm happy to see restaurants opening up for lunch. And last night I was at Cafe Gia for dinner and they said they're open for lunch due to COVID. I mean, you cannot, there are very few places you can go sit down and have lunch. So if you're in Baltimore, Little Italy, Cafe Gia is doing lunch. As I mentioned earlier in the show, my guest is going to be next week, Amanda Cushman. She began her food career in catering in Manhattan and worked with Martha Stewart and Glorious Foods before entering the world of recipe development for Food and Wine Magazine, Cooking Light, Veteran, Vegetarian Times, Fine Cooking, and Ladies Home Journal. We will talk live with her in Spain where she has moved to retire and uh, she has been a personal chef for the people like Neil Patrick Harris, Molly Sims, Ann Archer, Randy Newman. I want to say if you want to reach out to me, you can contact me at food at jmoreliving.com. My social is at Dara Cooks. This show will be up on Jaymore Living's Facebook page and website jmoreliving.com for perpetuity. Feel free to check it out, share with your friends who will enjoy it. And we love when you go back into the archives and look at the other interviews. We've had a very diverse guest. So feel free to do that uh, until next week. I hope your plates remain full and I will see you then.